Okay, recording so, started. So we can start good. from the first item. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so just a quick update. Uh, I've started working on the uh, authentication policy that Benchang started a while ago. Uh, so mainly I rewrite the thing to, you know, give more precise uh, how to filter the rule, the policy to apply on the on the client and, and workloads. Um, what need to be go separate the the six the um, what is that the privacy, the security and credential and uh, provide the idea how to use this policy uh, for migration as well. Uh, so the three important component is one is uh, we how to filter or how to select policy for what connection we are going to use the same um, match rules that we have with uh, general CRD config. Uh, so basically you can specify what is a client service or name or service or namespace. Uh, and the target, which is the work workload, uh, name and service. Um, so open question here is, uh, should you also use other attributes like header or uh, part, request part, as part of the um, filter? Um, that could give us more refine uh, the way it's to- part of the um, authentication filter? Yes. So, um, I guess maybe we're skipping a little ahead to what the architecture is going to be, um, with with some filter that that's that's doing this in uh, in Envoy. Is that is that what we're imagining? Right. I mean, I just this mostly focus on uh, how. To, we select which policy to use for the request based on the you know the, the client and server identity as well as the result of the, the the some information in the header of the request to say you know using Zot or using some other uh, credential. Um, so I think the most trivial right now is just using the source and the target uh, name and namespace to limit to to select the policy, and we can add other letter if it's applicable. Does it make sense? Um, so for the policy itself, uh, we separate it in two parts: the privacy, which it concern only like using plain text or TLS, and the credential is specify what can be used for the authenticate. Uh, uh, so for credential, it can be like MTLS, which somewhat imply uh, privacy had to be used, TLS had to be used. Or it can be other methods like Zot or API key or etc. Or we can even specify a custom which uh, the user can provide a you know uh, provide their own implementation using some um, adapt adapter in the mixer. Uh, so part of the the credential spec, we will have the arguments which if which is like basically um, a key value pair where user can uh, provide all the information they need for their implementation of uh, authentications. So um, privacy policy um, doesn't necessarily feel like authentication no um so are we like putting this in the authentication policy proposal just because our methods of authentication are include mutual tls which sort of gets the privacy aspect in as well, well yes and i mean one main thing is 
we need to define somewhere and having a separate policy just for the privacy seem overkill and uh, bundle with this authentication policy may be the easiest way to add them because like as a, uh, you know like like MTLS for example requires that as well so it's it's not like a strong binding but it seemed to be reasonable to combine Does it make sense? Yeah, sorry, just trying to take notes. <laughs> okay, no worry. Uh, so basically, for the credential, we have a method to define what authentication type is going to be used. Uh, come with that is the argument, which user can provide all the information uh, to supplement the, the implementations. And the attribute is basically the output is uh, what it can be used, uh, what it can, what it should output to be used for the next step, like authorizations or for the end user um, uh, authentications. And to support migration, basically the idea borrow from what we do with the MTLS migration right now. Uh, basically, we allow people to provide two policy. One will be inactive to make the server ready to handle it, but uh, not accepting the, the client don't have to use that one yet. And then we update the policy to flip the active uh, to inactive and vice versa to tell the client to switch to use a new policy and then the last step is migrate uh, is move the old policy away so why is it that we want to um have this be two policies so for the migration we only want to make sure the server side can handle both type of authentications of privacy so so when you have these two policies, one active and and one inactive, the server is doing something different. Like the server is preparing itself to accept. Yes. Right. I feel like there may be a clearer way to uh, express this configuration. Right, rather than like creating two policy objects and like having the inactive object mm -hmm. still actually affect what uh, what is what's happening in your cluster feels counterintuitive to me, and I think it would be more straightforward to have one policy object and have a setting that that actually you know has the server prepare itself. You see, do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Wow, I mean, from what I see, it just uh, it just how you def what the structure you to define the policy, right? Uh, right now, we treat each policy as um, as one container, one one uh, configurations, but you can have policies that's embedded to configuration inside. Uh, it's just a presentation to me. What is just the presentation? Like have the conflict as have the have the way to tell server to accept to different configuration to different uh, authentication policy. You still need to uh, to specify what policy you want the server to handle, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. So it's. So in your spec, I mean, in your configuration CID, you still need to put both policies somewhere, either like next to each other or in some list. I don't know. Uh, sure. I mean, I, that that would definitely be be preferable, right? To have have one CRD that you're you're modifying, even if it contain, even if that one CRD contains two policies. 
but like if you're if you're separating this this out right there's two objects that you're manipulating and one you mark inactive is actually having an and the, the presence or absence of an inactive uh, object like actually changes what the cluster is doing that's that's super weird like operators are going to be very confused no, but uh, uh, now my, my proposal is still under the same CRD. It just have two policy in the same CRD. Uh, not policy, like two privacy rule and two prior two credential rule in the same CRD. Okay. Yeah, it's not two different CRDs, two different configs. So um, I can't see the the proposal anymore, but I, I, I yeah, uh, that it's probably fine. But I think we should avoid like calling it an inactive policy. Um, we should sure. find some other some other term for this thing, which is like this is the thing that you want the server to prepare itself to do, right? Mm -hmm. That's not inactive. That's that is a thing, that that's active config. Yeah, I mean, t sure. Um, so anyway, I have a link in the notes. Uh, whenever Google Doc get back, uh, you can jump in and uh, review that again. Um, that's all about it. I mean, a lot of details didn't work in progress, so if you were able to have them, that's, that's going to be good as well. Like end user authentication and uh, some ingress rules that I don't know how to handle yet. Yeah, I think unfortunately we don't have the Google Doc. Um, otherwise, we can go in further details. Uh, okay, so let me start my part. So uh, I want to give some updates on the Istio RBAC. Uh, discussion. Uh, go present. Um, so, uh, so currently we have uh, active discussion uh, inside Google um, because we have uh, several RBAC systems, uh, including Cloud IAM and the RPC Secure Policy, and uh, uh, we are discussing which style we should follow. Like uh, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes RBAC is uh, similar to Cloud IAM style. Um, but it has some uh, trick, uh, uh, slight difference as uh, what I will explain. Uh, so in the Cloud IAM style, uh, we have explicit uh, row definition. Uh, you define row object and the row binding object. And uh, uh, in Cloud IAM, the rows are defined on a resource type. Uh, and then in the binding, you basically bind the resource instance to the row, row object. Um, so for example, the row is uh, a project editor, and in the binding, you can bind to the specific project. Uh, so Cloud IAM actually has the syntax called uh, who has what row on what resource instance. Uh, and uh, Cloud IAM also provides a resource hierarchy. In uh, the RPC security policies uh, is uh, a little different style. Uh, it's designed to support uh, master level access control. So it has a file. Every service has a policy file. And uh, in the policy file, you define uh, some permission string. Uh, you say, in order to access this method, you need uh, this permission. And uh, then you bind this uh, a list of permissions to a list of subjects. So, um, so uh, in this case, there's uh, no explicit row definition. Uh, you basically bind uh, a list of permissions to a list of subjects. And uh, I actually wanted to use the design doc, but I don't think it's, uh, the link is working right now. So, so I'm trying to use the, another slide. Uh, so, so this is the uh, RPC security policy style, if you, look, if you take a look. Uh, it's uh, actually, uh, actually my, uh, 
first the proposal was uh, based on these uh, styles. Uh, as, as I said, uh, it has uh, mappings. And uh, uh, in, this, in this case, uh, I said the resource type is the service. So uh, we have list of methods. Uh, oh, oh, wait. Um, uh, uh, because the resource type is a service, so actually the resource here are all referred to service names. Um, you can also make the resource type to be method. Then the resources here refer to a list of methods or paths. And uh, then you specify the permission stream. Um, and in the policies, you basically map the list of permissions to, um, to the members. And uh, this is our current design. Uh, so our current design, we have the service row and the service row binding. Uh, so, so, in, uh, so we are uh, defining the same policy, just using uh, different language. In this language, we have a row definition, which is defined on the service object. We are saying service is rating. So this row applies to this rating service. And uh, the service row binding uh, binds the rating service to the subject, which is a service account. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the difference is uh, uh, in the in the RPC security policy style, uh, everything is uh, within one file. So this file applies to a service or apply to a namespace. Uh, and uh, in the second, uh, in the current design, we have row object and a row binding object. Uh, so the current design is actually more close to the Kubernetes style. Uh, I think that's the goal we are trying to align with the Kubernetes RBAC. Um, the, the biggest uh, question from, um, from like a different team uh, here inside Google is uh, um, the, the row is, uh, is not very re reusable because it's basically bind to the rating service in this case. Uh, it's not- Wait, say that last bit. It's bound to the rating service? Yeah, so so basically, it's bound to a specific service object. Uh, so, but it can, it can be to more than one though. Yeah, it can be but more than one, yes. Since, since there's, there's, you can have multiple rules. Like the two examples that you have are each mm -hmm. like one service. But you you could have a role that right. uh, includes permissions on multiple services. Right. Yeah. As long as they're in the same namespace. Yeah. Yeah. So this is our. Uh, so this is the example in our design doc, right? So you can have a row that can include uh, multiple service objects. Uh, I think the use case our PM mentioned is uh, uh, they want to have. Uh, a general role that a predefined role that can apply to different service. Like every service has different. Um, for example, you have uh, one service account to be able to access service A, another service account to be able to access service B. In this case, we need to define two roles, one role for service A, the other role for service B. And then create a corresponding uh, bindings for that. Yeah, just uh, list the difference. Uh, currently, there's uh, no conclusion which style uh, we want to go with. Actually, uh, from, from uh, Vincent and I actually prefer to go with the current style because it creates a more consistent user experience for Kubernetes users. Uh, we propose to use Kubernetes RBAC to uh, set access control for modifying the policy itself, modifying Istio RBAC itself. And uh, we want to have the same style for our user to, um, to be able to set access control for, the, for their services. Yeah, so um, basically I just uh, list the pros and cons. Um, in the RPG security style, the pros is uh, uh, we have a single policy file. Uh, apply to a service or namespace. So we want to introduce too many row, row definitions. And uh, it's easy to view uh, who, has what, who has access to my service. 
from the policy file because everything is within one file. Um, the, I think the, the biggest uh, cons is, uh, is different from the existing Kubernetes RBAC style. Well, I mean, if, if we did that with, with mm -hmm. Istio, then like it, it wouldn't be RBAC anymore. Um, you can call it RBAC because it's implicit role. It's not, you know, there's no explicit role. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, a little you, can't call it, you can't call it RBAC if there is no definition of a I mean, role, that, surely. That's, that's like an access control list, right? Yeah. Like, you just, you just, like, directly list the permissions. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, we, we would that's have why to in Google it's called RPC security policy. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, yeah, we'd have to go with something like, like, um, you know, security ACLs or, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, for, for our current design, uh, it's uh, easy to create custom roles that uh, fits customers' needs. And uh, basically, the biggest uh, process uh, is consistent with the community RBAC style. Um, the, the biggest concern is uh, uh, people think that we may introduce too many role or objects because every service may have its own, own role, potentially. Well, I mean, that's true, but doesn't it come down to the point Spike raised, which is, do you want roles or not? And, I, and I'm not advocating for one or the other, but it seems like in some senses that that's what this boils down to, right? You either have roles or you don't have roles. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the number of roles in your system is going to scale not explicitly like the number of services, but the number of unique uh, um, access yeah. pattern. Yeah, actually, I, I wanted to show some docs. I actually uh, try to support this uh, proposal. Uh, we actually can group the, uh, the number of services using the custom attributes. Like uh, you can, you can uh, using some label called uh, DB. Uh, and attached to different services. And uh, you can say one user can access all the DB services. And the creator, we can create a role for all the DB service. Um, and I oh, also... So you, just using label selectors to select services rather than explicit yeah. lists of them? Right. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So I actually have several dogs, but I cannot uh, show. Oh, actually, this one works. <laughs> it's not working now. OK. Um, yeah, so so I was trying to come up with some proposal to uh, to provide a predefined role scenario. Uh, uh, yeah, basically we want to provide some predefined role and uh, reuse it for different services. And uh, this is just general idea. I don't think we want to push it forward uh, at this moment. So I want to consider this as uh, some possible extension to the current RBAC model. Uh, so, so in this proposal, I just uh, I want to introduce uh, some parameter to the role. Like, so currently, uh, uh, the services we just uh, directly put the service name, um, but instead we can just use some parameter here, and uh, this role is called a uh, service admin, and you can create a role binding to uh, to bind this uh, service admin to any service. Like uh, in the role reference, you can you can specify what this uh, service admin should a uh, uh, service name should be. So so basically, this uh, in the binding we can bind the service role to the to the specific service object. Um, and you can bind the same role to a different service, which is called a service B. Um, uh, so this is not uh, the same as our current definition of a star. Uh, if you, so currently, if you specify star, that means uh, this role applies to all services. So this admin is not an admin for, for a particular service. Uh, in this case, it's admin for all the services. Uh, in addition, we may also extend it to support uh, um, access control for custom resources. I call it a resource level access control. Uh, so, for example, uh, you can consider a custom resource as a bookstore.shelf. 
and the shelf ID is the resource ID. So, so you can also extend this uh, parameter concept to, to the path. Um, basically, the shelf ID here is the path, inside the path. Uh, uh, yeah, it's the resource ID uh, inside the path. And uh, similarly, you can also supply the resource ID um, for, for this parameter, shelf ID. Like uh, you can say this user or this service account full has access to a particular bookstore, uh, bookstore shelf Acme object. So uh, this will make uh, the role more reusable and uh, also potentially support the access control for custom resources. But I, I don't, uh, yeah. Um, but this proposal actually introduced some new concept like a uh, parameter. So I think it will need more uh, thinking on this. So yeah. I present this uh, just say uh, for the current proposal, we, we have some possible extensions to support the, um, to support, to make the role more reusable. Um, so in, in pre presenting these extensions, are, are we, we talking about like some future work that we're actually executing on the, the proposal as it stands today? Or I, are, I are, are you saying that we need to uh, resolve whether or not these extensions are gonna be included you know, in sort of uh, version I think this, one of our is, this is just a brainstorming. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just some some ideas I have right now. But basically, I was saying the current model can be extended to support the use case for predefined role. Mm -hmm. yeah. But but so are, that's, the, that's the main point I want to make. Yeah, but I mean, is the is the current proposal uh, being built? Like, is is the plan that we're Kind of regardless of of you know whether or not we decide these extensions are a good idea, are we building the current proposal, or are we waiting on the current proposal until we decide about these extensions? Uh, I don't think there is a formal uh, decision yet. Uh, the the, this, uh, the extension is just some brainstorming. I I don't think it's uh, taken into account. So even uh, uh, as although I bring bring up this extension, I just uh, want to brainstorming. It's not actually in any of the execution plan. So uh, from my side, uh, it's just uh, my personal opinion. I want to have the first step build, build the current proposal. Then after that, maybe we can consider some extension. Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to push this extension. It's because it will take a long time. I don't think it will come to a conclusion very soon. Yeah, that sounds sensible to me. Um, but it, it sounded like that the, there's some kind of internal pushback on 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 this model uh, you're getting from somewhere. Uh, we are currently discussing with uh, different teams, so basically people have different ideas. We have support for for this different style, not including the extension. For this different style, different people have different preference. So why why are why are those people not in this call taking part in the conversation? Would that be helpful, or, or, or is that just wishful thinking? Oh, we already have two big meetings, <laughs> uh, uh, like uh, already very big meetings. So, yeah, if you have any feedback, I'll, I'll be glad to take it. Yeah, oh, sorry, I, I think I take too much time. Uh, maybe let's move on to the next uh, agenda. Jason, are you going to play? Yeah. yeah. Or maybe. You can... So, Shilin, do you want to provide? Uh, well, I'll pull up, pull this up. A, a little bit of context for what we're doing in the API Manager Group. Um, what our media goals are uh, with this uh, PFC. Yeah, um, I'm the TL uh, working on API management uh, support for East Two. Um, the you know, rough high level idea is, you know, um, to enhance the current uh, ESTU capability, you know, uh, in terms of quota and, you know, metrics reporting and log reporting, right? And enhance them with pro API level control. 
uh, we are also planning to add like you know API key, <clears throat> and um, other than that, you know, we want to support the poor API authentication and authorization, right? Obviously, there are some overlap between uh, the API management capability and the security capability. Um, so I would like to deem, deem this as kind of you know, the joint effort, right? Um, currently, you know, just to block you know the API management capability, we want we are proposing, you know, how we are going to implement the authentication and authorization. I think in the last um, security meeting we talk about, you know, we need to break down the authentication with authorization, and we prefer to, you know, uh, enforce the authentication in the proxy and authorization to be to be you know checked in in the mixer side, right? Because potentially the authentication need to be enforced by a specific backend, right? So in this meeting, um, we want to uh, we want to go one more step to focus on the authentication. Um, what kind of configuration we need, and uh, what is our plan of doing things, right? Uh, so th that's the rough context. Uh, but Jason, you know, is going to pre present more more details. Okay. Um, so to hopefully make this easier. Uh, I wanted we wanted to I want to narrow the scope of auth so it's not the overarching auth policy for all of Istio. It's end user auth specifically covering uh, JWT validation and API key uh, attribute extraction, um, and that's what the PR. That's the motivation for the PR was we are kind of plumbing through some of this from the proxy to the proxy's configuration from pilot. And we need to provide a configuration to the mixer client. It says, here's, there, there's a filter already um, in the SEO proxy for job uh, validation. We need to provide it a configuration. So we need to have something in S2 API for that purpose. Um, and then that's what's in this PR here that I have up on the screen. Um, so the intent is this is not, ideally this wouldn't be user facing. This would just be some internal implementation detail between generates the proxy's configuration, pilot, and the, the proxy or, or mixture client itself. Um, if there's some other top level off policy or security policy that we can derive this from, once that's in place, perfect. Um, but we, we don't have that yet. Uh, so again, that's the context is, is the, what the mixture client is consuming for end user auth. So it doesn't, we're not getting to MTLS or anything like that. Um, and so this, it, we have a, a JOT uh, message, and this is, should be fairly standard representation. Um, this has already been reviewed a little bit by um, Lizanne and Limen. Um, but it's just a kind of typical, what, what you would need to provide a JOT validation filter um, to issuers and audience. Jason, can you please walk over? This this is not a big uh, protobuf. Maybe you can just walk over each few other. Uh, yeah. So we have the issuer. Um, so this, there's there's ways that this is repeated and mapped onto different services, um, but this is a specific instance of, a, of validating a JOT. Um, so the the issuer, um, some repeated list of audiences, the URI where we would uh, fetch the uh, the public key from, and then uh, here, there is some option about whether we should forward that dot onto the mixer or not. Um, so it, in some cases, it might be a security issue, or maybe it's just not necessary, required by the mixer. It's, it's, it would be sufficient that the, the validation is done um, by the proxy. And then there's something for the, the cache duration, which could logically be configured at a higher level. But the way this is represented here, it's, it, we have a per dot uh, public key. Expiration. So the public key cache duration that is part of the part of the draw token itself, right? It's no. So so the way the filter is written now, um, it will fetch it, it will fetch the um, the public key from the URI. We don't want to do that every request, so there's some caching involved. But how long we how long we, we hold on to that that key before we um, expire it and fetch a new one? Well, so this is mainly about you know how much you want to cache the right. result basically. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so the the forward draw, um, according to you, basically the forward draw basically that brings controlling whether we need to forward this draw token to the mixer or not, right? Yeah. Um, so, so 
I'm just wondering, like, you know, are there any security concerns for that? Uh, in not forwarding it, or in, I mean, there's security. The reason we have the option of of not forwarding it would be possibly security related. You, you don't want that to be. Um, in, in the case if you, if you had delegated um, auth, you wouldn't want to forward your got down the, the request chain. Um, so. So I'm not so sure. Are you saying this forward jot is to forward to the next proxy or forward to the mixer? Uh, I think I said it to the mixer, but it's actually to the. Um, it would strip it from the HTTP request itself. So if you had delegated off, you you could strip it from the request, so that it wouldn't be seen by downstream or da downstream uh, proxies. Oh, you think by default it's basically passed down, but once you said this, you know, not forwarding, you're going to strip it, strip it away, basically. The, the, so the there's reverse, but yeah. there's not an explicit of... JOT attribute, right? right. It, it it would just no. There's no such attribute. So it's, it's whether or not it would show up in the headers attribute, right? Yeah, we, right. we can add that if it's useful. Um, it, the, but so there were there were some more options in the in the initial version of this um, based on the, the existing filter, where you could strip out parts of the dot and forward that. Um, but the recommendation, uh, Lizanne's recommendation, was just to simplify and either take it out completely, or just have a simple boolean to to, to forward the entire thing. Yeah, yeah, so my, under yeah, my understanding is uh, this is uh, forwarding to uh, to the back uh, to the service backend, right? Yeah, it's, oh, it's okay. running yeah. along with the proxy. Yeah, if I you said to make sure that that was yeah, correct. I think that's the endpoints model. Yeah, yeah. If you can clarify that, you know, in the CL, right? The, the... It, yeah, I, no, I, I think it, think it says right. uh, do not forward to the application. It's... It, it says here about removing it from the HTTP request. So, I think the wording is correct. The words that came came out of my mouth just now were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. When in doubt, refer to what's written. Um, so, so that's that by itself is okay. That that that's a kind of a direct mapping of the, the existing filter, and then how that maps onto. So, how the mixture client uses that, that we then have this this spec. Um, but there's just some composability here. This might be. Um, over-engineered, and I'm happy to trim things out. Um, but there's some way to compose that. Um, so I guess the first thing that's that's notable here is we have an attribute match. The way the mixture client mixture client is constructed, we will apply policy based on an attribute match rather than so. It's a very generic mechanism that would apply for a service level policy, um, but also an operation or an API method, um, and you could refine it further. But typically, that would be a, a destination service or a, an API operation. Say for this operation, we want to apply job validation in this specific job validation. Uh, but maybe for another uh, method, we don't apply any validation, or we we enforce some different form of. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then, then the and and or is just kind of lifted from what um, uh, Envoy has an off uh, filter as well. I think um, that this may or may not this, this may be over engineered. Um, yeah, so this effort is particularly, uh, like, you know, I mean, that could be controversial, right? Because this rule is, uh, well, it's ex expressive enough. Um, it's just, you know, should we, you know, include this in the first, uh, in the first wearing? Uh, so right now, we only have job validation. Um, Oh, how about the API key? It's not possible. API key was here, but we're not really we're not API key. We are not validating. We're not validating yeah. anything with API key. We're just extracting it and forwarding that to. Yeah, I, I think that's that's actually a, a a good idea to have removed it as you have. That was one thing that struck me as a little strange when I was first reading this proposal. But it's confusing because the documentation would say API key is authentication or authorization, but we or it would be a form of authentication. And we said we we're doing authentication on the proxy. Yeah. So that's it's a gray area. It's it's, a, it's still in this PR. It's in a separate file, and it's not part of the the end user auth policy. So what I, I'm not sure that I understand about this um, auth policy spec is like there's this attribute match, um, and uh, if it is matched, you apply the policy. But what happens if the policy is not matched? Uh, if it's not matched, that would mean you, well, you wouldn't apply it. 
Yes. Well, but like practically, what does it mean if but practically does that mean is, applied? Suppose you have an open. So the way, this all gets derived from at some point from an open API spec for our purposes. And so if you define a an API that has um, three different methods, which we call or, or three different operations, say two of those could have job validation and the third would not. Um, you would def that would manifest itself here as a, an end user auth policy policy with an attribute match for the two operations that did have job validation, and but that wouldn't match the third operation that didn't have job validation. So so in that case, it wouldn't match, and you wouldn't apply. Um, no, no, I mean, I, I, I definitely understand that. I, I guess I'm just asking, like, say there's no policy. What does that mean? Does that mean the request is automatically allowed? Does that oh, mean yeah. the request is automatically denied? Does that mean it's missing some attributes? Like, what does it actually mean if uh -huh. there is no policy? It, it, I, I think you know we need to understand this as two different levels, right? First, you know, this context we are focusing on the authentication to validate whether the job is a valid job, job token or not, right? That's the first question. And the second one is, even if you get a valid job token, maybe you are not allowed to access something. That is the authorization part, right? So focus on the authentication. You know about you know to validate whether job token is valid or not, right? So what kind of rules or what kind of you know, obviously you know you just check the you know the um the signature if it is correct then yeah it passes right that's a very basic one but in addition to that what are the rules that are necessary to add um, that is probably debatable right uh, so are you asking whether you, you know so if we had a field here that said action type or, or action which was allow or deny. Right. To, to indicate whether no, no, no. I, 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 I'm not suggesting that you change this. I just, I'm just asking like a really technical, mechanical kind of question, right? Um, what happens if it doesn't match? If it doesn't exist, it would be the same behavior today, which is we don't do any sort of validation. So, so the, what happens is like you don't fill out any of the attributes that correspond to JOT validation, and the JOT is passed. Uh, up to or is 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 passed on as a header, like it's just sort of opaque. It just sort of goes straight through. That that's what we're saying. Uh, yeah, there's there's probably something to consider for. Um, there's probably some cases there where we you wouldn't have. It, it, there might be a different way to, to to express that, which we we can't do now. Which is, can you not do validation but just remove a job? I, I don't know if that's a valid use case. Uh, My understanding is if this rule somehow is violated, then the whole job token validation fails. Basically, it's invalid job token. Right, but if there's a case where you would want to, so so here you can, um, you, you do the validation and then remove the job. Is there a case where you'd want to just remove that for an operation, but not actually validate anything? Is that, is, is no. that, is that a question make sense? Uh, I think the I mean, if, actually if, if the view is that the job is, uh, is a sensitive piece of information, then yeah, you want to remove it, right? Right. So that, in that case, it would be somebody providing. Like, if I just provided a job for some, for an API that didn't need a job. Normal process is it, yeah. If you provide an invalid job token, the whole request is rejected. Yeah, it's not an invalid job token. It's, yeah. So so I think the the binding is uh, talking about the requirement for the authentication. So you're saying for this service, I require job authentication. Uh, then. Then you uh, each job policy specify uh, one job provider. Basically, uh, you need to make sure the job uh, uh, your uh, the the job the issuer field matches one of the issuer allowed issuer in the list. Okay, that totally makes sense. Okay, yeah. But what if if, if uh, it's uh, if it's not in the list, then it's uh, basically authentic uh, not unauthenticated request. And in that case, you know, the whole request should be rejected. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then the question, I mean, I, I really want to ask is, I understand, you know, for the issue, right? But for this, you know, complex uh, kind of auth policy, is this necessary? I mean, if we just want to validate just token, I don't think we need that. Yeah, but, I'm not sure that it's necessary out of the gate anyway. Yeah. My feeling if we want to introduce more, make it a, like a generic framework, then we may need this in the future. But yeah, for now, I don't think it's needed for this use case. So if there's things that 
I mean, we could make this very narrowly scope and just call it a job policy and be done with it. Um, I think there was some desire to have a, a initial framework that could be extended, but only define the specific, um, uh, like we have a one out, we have job, but it is a one out, so you could extend it and it could be composed to, to be a much, um, you know, cover more use cases in the future. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess in that sense, is that does the extensibility make sense in that context? That I mean, I think the the idea of of allowing, especially with the OR rules, definitely makes sense because you may you, you may want to accept jots from say more than one issuer, right? For example, so like that that definitely makes sense to me right out of the gate. It's this attribute match, um, maybe maybe not. I, I'm not I don't necessarily object to it. But like that's that seems to be much less valuable than just the ability to sort of compose these things into saying like I want to be able to uh, accept jots from multiple places. Yeah. So, so the actual match maybe there's another way to express that. The, the, our our requirement was to be able to say for a particular operation or service. No, but that is authorization. That should be done in the mixer side. Well, no, not if we. So you you could and, and please um, let me correct me if I'm wrong with. But you can define. You, you only want job validation on a particular operation, and so if you if apply that and you 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 enforce validation across all requests to a service, yeah. it, it rejects something that shouldn't be rejected. Yeah, I mean, unless you're in, unless the the so if the design is that like a failed uh, like a missing jot or uh, an invalid jot automatically like stops the request, then you absolutely do need to. Um, be able to, uh, I guess, control exactly what it's going to apply to below the level of a service. Because as you say, not every API endpoint may require it. But the, the other design would be to say, we're going to accept jots for this service. And then sort of regardless of whether a jot was provided, uh, regard like I guess if the jot was provided and invalid, maybe then you would reject. But like, any, regardless of whether another jot was provided, that would all that would all be passed to the authentication layer, or sorry, the authorization layer as attributes. I would even further argue that you know, uh, even if you know the API, you know, say the they want you know on that method level or maybe operation level or maybe service level, they want to you know reject if there's no jot token provided, right? That should be part of the that makes a check. That is a decision to be made by the tech behind, not on the proxy level. Well, so, so the uh, no, uh, actually, no? it should be decided in the proxy level. This yeah. authentication policy, basically, the binding part, is saying this service require just authentication. Right. So actually, that there's a separate piece down here, which is yeah. for Istio service and some broad definition of what a service is. Everything we talked about here in the end user auth policy spec, that should be that should map to a particular. Um, Service or a particular proxy. So, if you are going that route, the authentication configuration could be, you know, covering way beyond the authentication. It's pretty much, you know, authorization. You can support all the possible authorizations, right? No, the policy is just saying I I need a mutual TLS or I need a JOS authentication. Sure, but you know, why do we need to check specifically within the JOT JOT? Within the job, you want to you know verify, yeah. Like you know, the issue is you know blah blah basically. Yeah. Issue basically. Really makes sense, right? But you know, for, yeah. for the audiences, right? Yeah. Uh, no, it's not verifying the audience. It's verifying the issue. It's saying I only accept the job token issued by Google, or I only accept the job token issued by Firebase. Uh, or or zero. You can specify the issue. Yeah, but the the attribute match. Uh, part of this is is only useful if we want to start um, applying things at a granularity smaller than the service. Right, which which we do. So so in that case, it's you could like people are going to say, well, I'm going to accept uh, uh, jots from this issuer for this uh, for this particular API, and I'm going to accept jots from a different uh, issuer for like a different operation on that API. And it's for the, so there's also, we've talked about open API. There's cases where somebody has an API, but they don't necessarily use open API, in which case they could compose kind of an equivalent 
granularity by saying by just specifying uh, uh, using the, the the attribute what's it called the request path in the request method, right? It's, which is is roughly similar to an API operation, but you can't you're not doing a prefix match or, or a templated match. Um, but but it is there is additional granularity, like you said, beyond just the service level match. Um, so do, do you guys maybe think we can just you know remove this uh, in the first uh, implementation? Maybe we, this is a little bit controversial, I would say. With the attribute match, yeah, I, I think we need the attribute match. And, and well, so because we have zero minutes left, um, is this? I think one of the things that was missing, definitely in, in the initial PR, and then even in the follow up when I added comments, was the context. For what what we're trying to do? Um, do you feel like that's that we have a good idea now of what? We're actually trying to do here, and what we're not trying to do, and yeah, I think so. Um, if so, um, can we follow up either offline to the PR and comments, or I mean, is there is there any fundamental problem here, or is it just? I mean, I, I'd be happy to change the representation of that match. Um, if there is there something else that people are more comfortable with, uh, for example, um, if there was if it was explicit like an operation ID or a service. Um, no, I mean, I think that that like the the question is a lot more fundamental about like what responsibilities do we put in the authentication layer versus what is in the authorization layer. Exactly. So we can we can follow up um, kind of offline about that. Okay. So so that goes to because there was one doc here um, which I opened up before Google Docs became inaccessible, which was about auth for API management, problem statement, and three different approaches to how we. Partition that responsibility. Yes. Are you, are you suggesting that we need to revisit that? Um, no, no, no. I, that, yeah. That's about where you locate those responsibilities, not what uh, is the extent of of those responsibilities. Basically, this is about where do you draw the line between authentication and authorization, not where do you where in the network architecture do you locate uh, the things that are performing those responsibilities, which is what this document is about. Okay. So maybe we follow up in a separate design design meeting, or we just uh, you know follow. I mean, up I'm happy to, to uh, comment on the PR. Okay. And so, so the goal, one of the things I try to do is narrow the scope of this as well. So it's it's not the impact if you if we have to tweak this a little bit is it's not user facing in the same way um, as a the security policy that you discussed at the beginning of the meeting. So we can, we can still, um, I guess the bar is maybe a bit lower in terms of, um, it's not set in stone the first time we, we push the PR in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Ooh, excellent. Thank you very much, guys. OK, cool. Thank you, guys. Continuing.